Hey guys, welcome into the Guilty as Charged podcast. My name is Steven. I am your host. It is officially week one. We're recording this right as the Dallas Cowboys are about to take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Could not be more excited for the return of football. Of course, here with my guys, Tyler and Alex. Tyler, we'll start with you today. How are you doing, man? I'm so excited, man. There are so many questions that I need answered about this team, about this coach, about the players, about the injuries on the injury report. I can't wait to get started. It seems like it's going to be a fantastic season, and I'm so happy to be doing this with you guys for the second year. Yes, so excited to head, you know, this the fact that this is our second year, like it feels like we really have been doing this forever, but I have mm-hmm. like this warped idea of time in my head because 2020 <laughs> just sucked so yep. much ass. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm really excited to do this uh, second season with you guys. Alex, just fresh off of his appearance on the Ref the District, did a great job on YouTube with those guys previewing the game. So go check that out. Alex, how are you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Pleasure to be on with those guys. Uh, now we got to beat their football team, though. So, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for football season to start. Uh, I'm so happy that we are not doing one hour long kicker podcasts. Um, that was some really dark times back in, you know, May and June. So oh, yeah. we, we made it through to the end. Yeah. So now, now we just are hopeful that the kicker situation really has been sorted out because uh, we cannot at, we cannot handle any more kicker episodes. So <laughs> please, Tristan Visca, you know, work out. Um, before we get started, have to give a shout out to our sponsor, Busser Sportsbook. Uh, of course, we've been partnering with them for the last month or so, and they have a brand new deal for you guys. So go and check them out. The link is in below. The next five accounts that sign up using our link will receive a $10 free bet to use this weekend on the NFL games. Of course, that is addition to the 100% bonus on the deposit. So uh, please go check that out. The link and promo code is in the description. So please go check them out. As always, be sure to smash that like button, comment, and, and let us know what you think of what we're going to be talking about. Subscribe to the channel and leave us a rating or review on all podcast platforms. That being said, let's dive right into the week one preview. We going, are going to start about those ominous injury reports that the Chargers <sighs> are infamously uh, famous for. So, um, of course, Everyone's going to be focusing on Austin Eckler, and we'll get into the ramifications of his DNP today. Uh, But Brian Bulaga actually is a full participant so far in the two days that we have had practices. Defensive back Trey Marshall is another DNP alongside Austin Eckler, uh, dealing with a little bit of an ankle issue. Uh, So that we'll have to talk about that one as well. Then Gabe Neighbors is listed on the injury report, uh, but he is listed as a full participant. Uh, Justin Jackson, the notable name not on the injury report for the Chargers, uh, is full go, according to Brandon Staley, which is obviously good news, especially if Austin Eckler is not going to uh, play. But let's let's focus in on Austin Eckler first and foremost. Alex, do you lean towards him playing this week? Uh, And if he doesn't play, what do you kind of make of the rushing attack uh, behind him? All depends on what happens tomorrow, really. I mean, if he gets a third straight DNP tomorrow, then I think it's pretty clear he's not going to play. Right. If he gets a limited practice, I feel like he's going to play just because he has been working to the sides uh, and also uh, had his pad and helmet on today. So, I mean, you know, they've been you know pretty cautious with him. Uh, I think it's more that than him having like a really bad injury or something. So um, all depends on what happens, I guess, when you're watching this today on Friday. Uh, so what happens at that practice will really determine it. But uh, if he can't go, I am not too concerned about the rushing attack. Uh, I think you do have Justin Jackson, who's been able to step in for Austin Eckler. Now, can he stay healthy for the whole game? That's a different question. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, right. he, hopefully he doesn't have some like lingering groin or hamstring injury himself, maybe early in the game. But I am confident in his abilities if he is able to stay healthy and then of course, you have Larry Roundtree, who I think showed a lot of pop uh, in the preseason. Joshua Kelly, less so confident in. But again, you know, behind this offensive line, I think he can at least get through some holes here and there. Um, Going to be a bit patchwork. And obviously, there's no real substitute for what Austin Eckler does in the rushing and the receiving game. But I think Justin Jackson, as far as this team is concerned, is probably the closest thing you're going to do. So if you have Keenan Allen and everybody else healthy, I don't think you could be too upset about it. 
I think he plays. I, it would be the funniest thing ever to have him not play after suiting up and staying out there with all his teammates. And it's like, oh, he just was doing that for fun. Like, I, I really think he is going to play. Um, right. Might be willing that into existence, but here we are. Uh, because I really need, you know, the Chargers really need Austin Eckler to challenge the secondary and those linebackers. And without him, I'm worried about that passing game. More so than the running game, in my opinion. Um, in 2019, when Eckler played that full season, was actually being utilized as a receiver. He had 11 targets past a depth of 10 yards. And last year, Jackson and Kelly, granted it was last year, so that's a little different. Um, but Jackson and Kelly had one target past 10 yards, and it wasn't even completed. And then you have Roundtree, who wasn't even known yeah. for being that kind of receiving threat yet. Uh, so, yeah, definitely concerning there. As far as Jackson being healthy, that's great. Based on what I've seen from him in limited action uh, in the preseason and at the scrimmage, he is the primary backup. He's the only guy behind Eckler who can spell him as both a runner and a receiver. Um, but either way, I do think I, I think it's unfortunate that even though the Chargers have drafted a running back three of the last four years, after Eckler, oh. once Eckler go, if Eckler goes down, we're still like, uh, maybe it's Kelly or maybe it's Jackson or maybe it's Roundtree. Like we really don't know, even though they've invested so much in the running backs, we don't really know who the true RB two is going to be. I think it's Jackson. I'm pretty sure it's Jackson, but I don't know that definitively, and that stings considering they've invested so much in their running backs so far, and yet we still really don't know. Yeah, I, I think the thing that, you know, of course, Austin Eckler to Justin Jackson it, it is, you know, a downgrade. And that's no shade to Jackson because I think he is an efficient running back. But Eckler is just he's so, so good. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all have talked about, you know, him having a monster year. But I think that's really spot on, Tyler. I think that hurts the passing game more than the rushing attack because I think, you know, as long as the offensive line is, is getting some push and, you know, we'll see. Uh, really kind of what this rushing attack looks like for the first time, you know, with everybody on the field in, in terms of the offensive linemen. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I have confidence in Jackson and Roundtree and Kelly to kind of figure it out uh, in, in terms of running the football. And of course, Justin Herbert, you know, he could certainly make an impact, you know, mm -hmm. pop a big run for 25 yards or so um, if they, if given a chance. But I, I do agree that the passing game really kind of, uh, suffers more so than the rushing attack, which um, the running attack definitely could could take a step back or two. But um, Eckler is just so versatile as a pass catcher that I think it hurts. It. Um, on the flip side, of course, the offensive line, Brian Balaga being a full participant two days in a row is, is really fantastic news. Uh, Brandon Staley mentioned on Tuesday that it seemed like he was trending towards playing. Um, unfortunately, this is kind of going to be a, a weekly song and dance with Brian Balaga. That's just where he's at in this stage of in his career i don't think uh obviously i would love for him to not be on injury reports but it seems like that's going to be you know a, a weekly thing and as long as they're able to get him to play you know 13 14 games i think that's going to be a, a huge win for him especially in a game like this where you have montez sweat and chase young like it, it's not just like you have the one edge rusher that you can you know if you have a weak right tackle you can chip him you can roll out to the opposite direction like you need both tackles to be healthy and effective in this game. And it's obviously good news that Brian Balaga is uh, trending in the right direction there. Right. I mean, I think Brian Balaga, you know, just being able to play 60 minutes in this game is just so important. Um, you know, with what Stephen mentioned with Washington's edge rushers and the fact that, oh, on the other side of Brian Balaga is, of course, Chase Young challenging Rashawn Slater, right? In your first game in the NFL, welcome. Uh, right. So there is that element to it. Um, you know, I think as long as Brian Balaga can, you know, at least stay healthy through the game, he doesn't necessarily need to have the best performance, but just prevent us from putting Storm Norton or Drake Pipkins on the field. <laughs> and I think we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Balaga healthy is, is great news, especially if Eckler, for whatever reason is out, they need the best offensive line they can out there. And Balaga is much better than Norton. Um, I don't see how Sweat and Young are stopped at all by Storm Norton. Uh, Balaga is going to have to go up against Sweat about two thirds of the time. And then I believe Chase Young lines up over the left tackle seventy five percent of the time, which means the other quarter of the time he's going up against Balaga. So they really need him out there. So I'm happy he's very healthy. I know fans were a little like, "Oh, you cut him, trade him, whatever." He's stealing from the Chargers, but like you said, this is going to be a weekly thing for him. He's probably yeah. going to be on the injury report every single week. He might not even be practicing some weeks. I don't know how that works um, with their new their plan for him and what the Packers did, but. Yeah, it is what it is. As long as he's out there and he's healthy, that's good enough for me because he is much better than the other options behind him. 
Yeah, it really is going to be fascinating to see how that whole thing pans out because he like he said in his thing is like we're pretty much doing the same thing that I was doing in Green Bay in 2019. You know, of course, a season where he played 16 games. That's only happened uh, two other times, I think, in his career. Um, a lot of 14 games played seasons, you know, some 12 games. And then, of course, a season like last year, really, unfortunately, just, you know, every single injury possible could happen, did happen for him. Um, and then Trey Marshall, um, I don't think he's going to play. It sounded like Brandon Staley really didn't expect him to make any progress this week. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if they just put him as like a weekly inactive or if they do decide to activate a uh, Ben DeLuca or um, I forget the corner that they just signed to the practice squad. Um, I can't remember because Keeman Hall is on the active squad now, right? It's like Keandre, Keandre Thomas. There you go. Keandre or DeAndre? Keandre. 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 Okay. So it is going to be interesting. I don't think they necessarily have to activate one of those players. Um, they might just decide to make Trey Marshall inactive, but um, I'm not super concerned about that, especially because we haven't seen him play on the team. I don't know about you guys, but that's how kind of I feel right now. I feel like they've mostly said that Trey Marshall's kind of a special teams player. I mean, obviously, if he were to get yeah. into a game, he would get some defensive snaps here and there. Um, but you already have been rolling in training camp and the preseason with these four guys at safety, right? Like, so I don't think that's going to drastically change with Trey Marshall here. They may just bring him in for games where they feel like they need a little bit of edge on special teams help and special teams tackling uh, against teams that have really good special teams. So, I mean, that's how I think they're going to use him. Not going to be too concerned whether he plays or is active one way or another this week. Um, whether or not they would activate a Ben DeLuca or somebody like that, I don't know. That might be dependent on the situation, but uh, I, I feel like he's just kind of going to be in the bottom eight or ten guys every week, and depending on the situation, they may use him, they may not. I kind of like that the main complaint of some of the late-round draft picks for the Chargers as well Oh, you know, th why would you only draft guys to play special teams? And yet Brandon Staley will cut Tyron Johnson because he doesn't play special teams. And they will hold yeah. on and prioritize special teams players. It's kind of interesting looking back and thinking of someone like Marshall. Obviously, we don't know much about him. I'm a little annoyed that he was already hurt. And then yeah. they brought him onto the roster. Like, I don't... Is that good team building? I don't know if that's really a great option. <laughs> well, that's also the case with uh, Eric Banks, who's, who's dealing with a back injury himself. So, you know, that's also a thing. Is he? Is he? He's well, not on the injury I, report. He's not on the injury report, but I mean, prior to coming here, like that's part of the reason the Rams didn't cut him. So, I mean, maybe he's not oh. officially listed there, but he was dealing with that for most of the preseason. Oh, that's right. You sent that in the in the messenger. You sent that he was, that's part of the reason why he was cut. So, yeah. um, interesting that he's not on the injury report. Um, of course, the last thing in terms of injuries, thankfully for the Chargers in Washington, like this is probably the game that has the smallest injury reports from what I've seen. You know, mm -hmm. you look at like the Bears matchup this weekend and the, each team has like seven names or more. So, uh, you know, count your count your blessings this weekend. Knock on wood, of course. Um, but look, it looks like Curtis Samuel is not going to play. Um, he has not really practiced or played all summer long. He's been dealing with a groin injury himself. Um, so it, it remains to be seen, of course, how they're going to integrate him. I think that was kind of looked at as a really smart signing at the time. Um, and he's kind of like that Debo Samuel light kind of player that is, you know, can give you some rushing ability, give you some receiving ability. So I think they'll be okay. You know, they've been practicing without him all summer long. I don't really see that impacting much. I, I just think you'll see more Antonio Gibson and more JD McKissick, which probably was going to happen anyway. Uh, so me personally, not super concerned and we're not expecting, you know, uh, Curtis Samuel to make that much of a difference. But his backup potentially could. I don't know how much Humphreys is going to play, but both you and I really like Deami Brown. And so yeah. that means Asante Samuel Jr. could get another matchup with him, which I believe Samuel Jr. won, although Brown did have a pretty good day against the Florida State Seminoles. But it'll be a really nice matchup to see them go against each other again if he plays. Um, I know Fitz, I mean, if Fitz, if Fitz match magic is going to happen, targeting a guy like Deami Brown deep for like that last minute Hail Mary, 40 yard pass, whatever to set up a, a field goal to win the game or something like that. Like that, that's the guy you want to pair with him. I believe his average depth of, tar of target in college was like 16 yards. So yeah. you really, you're going to push this guy downfield. And I think Fitzmagic and De'Ami Brown could be a good, uh, good mix there. 
Yeah, so I think Fitzpatrick just... With Curtis Samuel, that obviously is somebody that you would want on the field to stretch it, but like I feel like you're just getting a natural stretching on the field by having Ryan Fitzpatrick over Alex Smith, right? I mean, uh, you had Ryan Fitzpatrick close to eight yards per attempt last year, Alex Smith close to six yards, right? So that is a pretty significant difference uh, when you look at the kind of style of football that they play. Alex Smith is not afraid to you know cork the ball downfield regardless of who his receivers are, for better or worse. Uh, and then that's kind of what people love about him. But uh, I, I think that that's just going to be the case in this game, right? Um, e- even if Curtis Samuel doesn't play, I still feel like they'll get those downfield opportunities, just a matter of whether the Chargers can stop them. Well, you guys are, are stealing some of what I had prepared for our next topic, man. Uh, I love it. Jumping the game, jumping the gun, talking about football. You know, it's great. Uh, really excited about this matchup overall. Um, that being said, we're going to talk about some of the bigger storylines of the Chargers versus football team matchup. Um, since you guys kind of took some of it, I'm going to go right into my storyline, which is Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, you know, I was able to interview Al Galdi uh, of the Al Galdi podcast. And one of the things that he mentioned is that really the Washington football team last year had the worst <laughs> passing attack in the league, which uh, really, it, it's kind of no surprise given the fact that they had like four games of Dwayne Haskins, four games of uh, Kyle Allen, five or six games of Alex Smith, and then uh, back to Kyle Allen, and then back to Smith, and then back to Taylor Heineke for the playoffs. And then, of course, the receiving core was just not very good. So I'm very curious to see how this passing attack works. Um, of course, Tyler mentioned, you know, the deep ball ability and Alex did do kind of adding that explosive play ability. Uh, with Ryan Fitzpatrick. But I think the thing that kind of gets lost from last year because everybody kind of just remembers that Tua wasn't very good. Um, He just like wasn't throwing turnovers. But everybody kind of talks about Ryan Fitzpatrick from last season that he was like this, you know, amazing quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. And that really just was not the case. Like he uh, was really just himself. Like he had three interceptions against the Patriots. He had two interceptions against somebody else. And according to Pro Football Focus, which I know everybody kind of poo-poos on on PFF, um, but according to PFF, he had – let me make sure I get this right – he was ninth in the turnover-worthy play percentage from quarterbacks uh, tied with Carson Wentz. So he still is going to take those chances, and he still is going to give the defense opportunities, of course – if you have a player like Terry McLaurin and Deami Brown makes a, a really you know nice leap in his first game, then of course you could see some plays. But he's going to give opportunities to the Chargers defense to make some plays. Like that's just who he is. That's who he always has been. And you know it's up to the Chargers to kind of take advantage. So what kind of version are we getting? And Ryan Fitzpatrick really is my biggest storyline. Are we getting, you know, a very good version of him this game and the next game he throws the three picks? Or are the Chargers kind of able to really take advantage? Maybe Derwin James gets a pick, a Southie Sammy Jr. who Tyler mentioned gets a pick. And I really think that's kind of a key thing in this game. Like they the Chargers have to get some takeaways. They have to force Ryan Fitzpatrick into some of those mental errors and uh really give the offense some short fields in this game. I'm glad you brought up turnover worthy plays. I was looking for some sort of weakness. I mean, there are weaknesses in his game, but in terms of numbers to show for this episode, there are a lot of stats Fitzpatrick is very good in, uh, surprisingly so. His passer rating dips only five points when not blitzing versus blitzing. I believe his his NFL rating or his passer rating when blitzed is actually higher than Justin Herbert's for what that's worth. So I was looking for like something and I couldn't find anything. So I'm glad you found that because I totally missed that. So good call there. Yeah, he was a, tied for 11th in adjusted completion percentage last year. Like when he's on, he's really on. Like he is mm-hmm. really a, a solid quarterback. It's just that like you never know if you're getting Fitz Magic or if you're getting Fitzpatrick. Like if you can get Fitzpatrick, you can make this team in you can cause this team into some turnovers and you know give the offense short fields, which we just talked about the pass rush, and I'm I'm sure we'll continue mm-hmm. to talk about it. Like the best way to give Justin Herbert and this offense, you know, easy points is to make sure that they are having short fields. And so I think this is is the biggest storyline that I'm focusing on. Are we getting Fitzpatrick or are we getting Fitzmagic? Is he going to get 
Like a couple of years ago when he was at Tampa Bay, he went into New Orleans in the Superdome and he threw six touchdowns. Like his passer rating was perfect. <laughs> like, are oh, we getting man. that Ryan Fitzpatrick? <laughs> or are we getting the one that went into New England last year and stunk it up and threw three picks? Like, you know, you just never know with Ryan Fitzpatrick. It is, it, it, to me, and that's the biggest storyline. Mm-hmm. I would say Ryan Fitzpatrick kind of reminds me uh, of what he is, at least in this stage of career, of like 2019 Philip Rivers a little bit. Like, if just a guy who's going to like pump the ball down the field uh, in sort of his like late stage years. Um, and so that's kind of what I think you have to worry about with him. Like, to me, you know, will he throw three picks? He might. Um, but, you know, I think last year he threw 13 touchdowns, eight interceptions uh, in seven 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 starts and i think nine games played total um but i I think the thing with him is just you you know if you can get pressure on him i think that's good but it's just such an upgrade over what they had last year in my opinion not necessarily that he's way better than alex smith but alex smith was just so limited in what he could do last year so i think even if ryan fitzpatrick is a little bit fits tragic this game um that could certainly <laughs> I like that there we go <laughs> that could certainly be the case uh like that you know new england performance you mentioned i still feel like he'll be a problem because uh just of the comparison with what washington was last year which was this dink and dunk team yeah. and like okay we're gonna defend the steelers really well but also we're gonna do nothing on offense that even has the potential like to create a turnover like we're gonna play things very safe so I think at least having Ryan Fitzpatrick gives their offense the chance to not be safe uh, and take those aggressive plays down the field. So that's something that I think if you're looking for this game uh, as to what Washington's offense will be, that's probably what it'll be. Um, Obviously he could throw three picks and the chargers can take advantage of those turnovers. Great. Um, But I think in general, Ryan Fitzpatrick is still a positive thing for Washington, just in terms of how he stretches the field. All right, Tyler, what is your biggest storyline of the week? This is going to be a straight up lie. There's no way in hell this is my biggest storyline, but I wanted something a little bit different. So I'm going to go with what does the special teams look like with everyone in place? And that is a storyline worth monitoring. The Washington football team has pieces. They're not great, and the Chargers could take advantage of it. So they brought in kick returner DeAndre Carter. He's, in general, a pretty below average returner and only averaged 20.8 yards per return last year and his mm-hmm. career long is only 31 and then you have dustin hopkins oh, who, who's on kickoffs gave opponents the fourth best starting field position last year credit it's not all his fault but in general their kickoff coverage wasn't great and then you got to go with viz Caino. i want to see how they look how does this team use him in terms of field goals what are they comfortable with can he get his leg going so last year and thank you arjun for this the chargers average fourth down spot was the opposing 40.6 yard line so that's about 57, 58 yard field goal, which Badgley has made before. He owns the record, but he was not going to consistently make that last year. I'd be surprised if he had made that once. Now they do have that leg to convert. So can he, in a very tight matchup, maybe kind of like the Baltimore playoff game, can he make those field goals for them at about that range to make every kick and because every point counts in this game. And so can the special teams bring everything together? We're finally going to see who's playing where, what this actual unit is on each side. And I want to see them perform well. And hopefully they can because they can't take advantage of it. Washington football team doesn't have great special teams pieces. Well, that's yeah, a great I mean, call. And sorry, Alex. Um, oh, uh, so, sorry, I was just going to say in terms of the kick returner and punt returner situation for the Chargers, um, right? Like Brandon Staley has said like, okay, KJ Hill is going to be the punt returner. We haven't had really anybody ask kick returner questions in the last week. So maybe he'll throw Larry Roundtree out there. Maybe he'll throw Nasir Adderley out there. We don't know. <laughs> Pretty sure it's Adderley. Yeah, I think he said that. I think he said that Adderley had the lead. If not, uh, it might have been Tuesday, but it might have been last week. Um, So I'm pretty sure it's going to be Adderley. And that's exciting. Like, he really is an electric kick returner. I know there are some who have kind of expressed concern about having a starter be the kick returner, but I think he'll be okay. And if they want to kind of spread it out between him and Larry Roundtree, that's okay Mm -hmm. as well. But I mean, I just mentioned, you know, giving the offense short fields. Like if Nasir Adderley is able to mm-hmm. to pop a, a big kick return, like that's a huge thing we've seen in other games that that is a really, real big swing of momentum. So um, that's, a, that's a good call. Uh, Alex, what is your biggest storyline of the week? 
I would say the cohesiveness of not just the offensive line, which people have talked about as not playing before, but I'd also say the defensive line. Um, you know, this is the first time Joey Bosa, Kyler Fackrell, uh, Justin Jones, and, and really everybody are going to play together. Obviously, Joey Bosa and Justin Jones uh, and uh, Linval Joseph played last year. But, you know, you do have all these guys kind of in this new defense uh, you know, we had Linval Joseph and Joey Bosa and Jerry Tillery and Justin Jones not play in the preseason. So I think what they're going to look like in this new defense is going to be interesting as well as how they play together. And then, of course, you look at the offensive line, which has been a topic, right? Like only Bushi, Filer and very limited Slater played in the preseason. Uh, you have Lindsley yeah. and uh, Lindsley and Blago, who did not play in the preseason at all. So and unfortunately, the first week of the season, you have to go against arguably the best defensive line in the NFL. Um, and so that's going to be a test. So I would just say because of how the Chargers in the tre- were in the trenches last year, game one, the fact that a lot of those guys haven't played, I think that's going to put a lot of that staley mantra of just getting to week one of the regular season to the test a little bit just to see how prepared these guys are without having really many you know live action reps. Yeah, one of the things that Corey Lindsley has uh, really harped on in his press conferences is, is the offensive line's ability to kind of solve problems. And, I mean, they're going to get baptized by fire, like, immediately with this group. And, you know, I tweeted this out, but, you know, I think if you had asked everybody, you know, just a general question, like, who had the most pressures last year for Washington, I think most people would have either said Montez, Sweater, Chase Young, but it was Jonathan Allen. And he's not the only one. Like, if you go down the list, if you combined the Chargers roster and the, the Washington football team roster from last year, the Washington football team would have the second, third, fourth, and fifth most productive pass oh, rushers man. before you get to <laughs> Jerry Tillery, who was the second on the Chargers. So it really is like a stacked group. And, you know, I talked to Al Galdi, and he mentioned that they have some good backups that they like too in Ionitis and uh, I think his name is uh, Stiple or Stimple or something like that. Um, I should have mentioned, I should have known that. I'm sorry. But um, the point is like this group really has like San Francisco 2019 defensive line vibes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody kind of is really focusing in on Chase Young and Montez Sweat and rightfully so. I think both of those players are fantastic chase young i expect to be you know a defensive player of the year kind of candidate but their defensive tackle group is very very stacked as well so you know this is a game where i'm very grateful to have a matt filer and Corey lindsley and ode abuji and not have dan feeney and forest lamp and company um but we're gonna see really quickly how fast this group can solve those problems that Corey lindsley has been talking about absolutely so i actually wanted to ask you steven about this because you're the offensive line expert um, so Chase Young rushed with an outside move 30.1% of the time last season, but yeah. he was way more effective with an inside move. His win rate and productivity tripled compared to his outside move. I don't know exactly what those were. I just wow. know it's charted as outside or inside. So I guess my question to you is, how do you prepare for someone who is that effective to the inside, but he'll only do, he only did it about uh, 11% of the time, those inside moves. Um, and that could change this year, sure. So how do you prepare for, for someone who, who only does that and he's so effective at it, but he only does it 10% of the time, but he's going to a third of the time use an outside move. Maybe speak to like preparation or pass sets or hand usage. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Like, I, I, how do you, I mean, obviously, how do you stop Chase Young? Good luck. <laughs> but you know, like, what would you, what would you do in that situation? How do you, what would you coach someone to do? Well, that kind of reminds me of like Melvin Ingram in his, in his heyday, because mm. Melvin Ingram was never really like, you know, a dip and a rip. Like Joey Bosa is great with an outside rush, right? That, that was never truly mm-hmm. melvin ingram's best asset like we all saw the spin moves we all saw the swim moves on the inside like melvin ingram was primarily you know an interior rusher and i think they could take a lesson from the colts and one of the things that the colts kind of did of course you have to have the personnel to do this right mm-hmm. but you slide protection to chase young's side and that leaves brian Belaga or whoever is right tackle on an island against the opposing defensive end which i am comfortable with brian Belaga against montez sweat if he's healthy If they have Storm Norton in this game, then they cannot do this. So you slide protection to the left side, and that opens up Matt Filer as someone who can be kind of a free roamer and either help on Chase Young or help on Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen with Corey Lindsley. Um, And that's really kind of how you protect that because the thing that the Colts did 
against the Chargers, which was so good, is that Quentin Nelson was the free roamer of the offensive line. They would slide protection to the left every time. That way, if Melvin Ingram you know, ripped or spun to the inside, Quentin Nelson, the best offensive guard in the league, was there to kind of clean things up. And, of course, we all saw the uh, splash play, if you will, when he really just laid Melvin Ingram out. And those are the kind of things that you can happen. I think that's more of what I would do. And then I would kind of leave a tight end on the opposite side to help out. Um, but that's just me. You can do the other, you can do the opposite. You can slide protection to the right and have a tight end, you know, helping out with Chase Young. But if he's that good on the inside, I would rather have the guard helping as opposed to a tight end. What a great answer, man. That is so good. I'm so proud of you, man. That was fantastic. Thank you. I was impromptu. Didn't prepare for that. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, let's move on to some key matchups for this game. Um, I think, you know, someone can obviously talk about the offensive and defensive line. Um, but Alex, where are you starting with a key matchup that you're focusing on? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the offensive and defensive line. And then the <laughs> obvious one is Chase Young and Rashawn Slater. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll take that one. I mean, and it's not just, you know, what their college film was, but for me, it's just the difference in experience that they both have now, right? Rashawn Slater has not played football in a year. Uh, he played briefly in the preseason against the Rams, and that's about it, right? Chase Young has been in the NFL and is battle tested, right? So I think it's going to be a very different kind of matchup uh, than they experienced in college. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. But if I was to go with sort of a non-obvious answer, um, I would just go probably on the defensive side of the ball, just uh, how Michael Davis ma uh, matches up against Terry McLaurin. Uh, I think that's going to be very interesting to watch, yeah. especially with no Curtis Samuel this game. Um, that might be who in some instances with speed, who you might put Michael Davis on in some certain scenarios like they do with Tyree Absolutely, Kill. Yeah. But now that it's just basically going to be Michael Davis against uh, Terry McLaurin the whole game, I think that'll be interesting to watch just because, you know, Terry is really good. Uh, I think that he's a great route runner, has some great release to him. So getting Michael Davis kind of tested here, you know, like we said, with the offensive line, a little bit of trial by fire, you know, uh, Michael Davis really showed out against Stephon Diggs and a lot of other key games last year. So I'm curious to see how he does against Terry. It's a great call there. Uh, yeah, the, the matchup's going to be uh, fascinating. I, like you said, Stefan Diggs uh, didn't do much against Davis. I'm pretty pretty excited about him there. But then again, like Davis is now the number one. He has to be the number one. And so I'm very excited to see what he can do. Uh, for me, the key matchup is going to be not necessarily like a 1v1 or anything, but it's how do the Chargers get after Jamin Davis as the Mike linebacker? Now, apparently that's what he's been playing. I talked to Mark Bullock, who did cover the Washington football team with the Athletic. And he was talking about that. Actually, Davis is strength right now is his pass coverage which, which kind of surprised me um but so he's being asked to play the mic so you know by nature he has to learn and make all the calls so he's been playing a little bit slow and, and, and taking a bit of time to get up to speed uh, in the first preseason game i guess that there were a lot of guards that were able to you know work up to the second level in the run game and reach him but he apparently he gradually got better um, but i want to see this offense really take advantage of him uh, hopefully eckler is out there as well because that would help quite a bit if you look at the first team reps uh, at the scrimmage, Lombardi really tried to make communication on defense a problem, whether it be with motion or play action or running you know, some parallel routes right in front of and behind the linebackers to force them to make some sort of decision. Now, the Chargers linebackers did do a very good job because they're so athletic. Um, but we'll see how Davis does because he's not exactly a veteran like the other three Chargers linebackers are. And of course, the goal of, you know, of, your, of your outside zone offense, your rushing scheme, is you really want to spread that defense very thin. And, and force the defense, particularly someone like Davis, to make poor decisions um, and let the running backs make that right decision. So between the different passing looks they could give him and the personal packages that they run, different guys they bring in and out, and of course that outside uh, zone run game, it, it should be very difficult for someone like Davis to make that right decision. So go get him and then good luck getting around you know, someone like Slater and Filer off that left side. So I really hope they somehow find a way to get after him, and they should because he's a rookie and though he's a very talented guy that we all liked coming out of the draft go after him because he's the rookie yeah that's absolutely a good call i think if you're going to attack the washington football defense it, i think to me it's through the linebackers and safeties i think mm -hmm. you know william jackson uh they lost ronald darby in free agency obviously with the with the denver broncos but i think william jackson is a slight upgrade there 
and Kendall Fuller is arguably one of the better slot corners in the league. So to me, I, if I'm kind of attacking this defense, I'm looking at who can make plays, you know, up the seams and, and kind of in the middle of that defense. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll mention them later, I'm sure, but the tight ends for this game uh, really are kind of uh, very important in this game. So for key matchup to me, um, I'm going to talk about the Chargers defensive tackles versus the Washington football interior. I think Brandon Scherf is rightfully, you know, ranked in terms of being an all pro pro bowl kind of player. Uh, he apparently has looked healthy and very spry. So i um, not expecting very many wins against Brandon Scherf this game, but I think the center Tyler Larson and the left guard, I, I should have written his name down again. I forget. Um, but those two are very workable. I, I think, you know, we'll see what the tackles are. I expect a good day for the edge rushers in general, especially Joey Bosa going up against a rookie offensive tackle, which I feel like is not being very being mentioned very frequently. Um, as much as I was high on Samuel Cosme, I think Bosa is going to have a, a huge, a huge game. So that being said, going back to the defensive tackles, I think there is something to be said for Ryan Fitzpatrick's ability to escape the pocket and make some plays. And it's really tough to do that when you have into your pressure. So if the Chargers defense is going to, you know, have success in this game, force some turnovers, get some sacks, I think we need to see some movement from the Chargers defensive tackles, whether that's Linval Joseph, Jerry Tillery, Justin Jones. You know, to me, they can really kind of exploit the center and left guard duo and be able to kind of push the pocket back on Fitzpatrick and not allow him to escape. So um, that to me is absolutely a matchup to keep an eye on. I'm glad you mentioned Tillery or the interior defensive line, of course. But of course, Jerry Tillery is kind of the guy I really need to see here. I was talking to Arjun about this because I, I had a question a long time ago and he was finally able to answer this question, give me some stats on this. The consensus last year, in my opinion, maybe you guys disagree, was that Tillery was solid in the interior, but the move to defensive end and doing what he you know, wasn't good at sort of hindered his production. I, I'm wrong, I guess. Believe it or not, the stats are nearly identical as a 4-3 defensive end a 4-3 defensive tackle. Granted, it's a different defense, um, but a defensive tackle, he had a 10.5% pass rush win rate, 4.6 pass rush productivity, and 20 pressures. And then he went to end, he had a 10% pass rush win, win rate, 4.2 pass rush productivity, and only 18 pressures. So it, it, at the end of it all, it's just like he wasn't good at either role. So now potentially focusing in as a defensive tackle hopefully will help him, and then Staley yeah. freeing up will hopefully help him. Um, especially since Bosa will command that double team. But I really want to see him perform well against a solid interior offensive line group because I, I think it's a solid interior offensive line group. I don't think they're amazing by any means, but I do think it's pretty solid, like you said. Um, so I, I want to see him perform because I, I honestly thought that he was just a lot better as a defensive tackle. And then we went to edge. It was terrible. But it turns out he was just wasn't good at either. So I want to see yeah. that next step because he apparently has had the phenomenal camp and deserved and earned the right to not play in the preseason at all. Right. Like he was good to go. So... Now I got to see it because I've been skeptical. I'd love to be proven wrong, but you got to show me first. Well, and Justin Jones is in that same vein. You know, everybody's mm -hmm. kind of talking about how he has looked. And, you know, Daniel Popper's bold prediction on Chargers Weekly was that he would have eight sacks. So, again, similar to the offensive line, like this is when we're going to see it. You know, you have a great mm -hmm. opportunity against a, you know, so-so to solid into your offensive line. And, you know, Jerry Tiller beating Brandon Scherf on a play and getting a sack would be a huge, huge deal for him. Same with Justin Jones. Um, so that's a, a, a great opportunity for these guys. You know, I think Jerry Tillery did earn it in the eyes of the coaching staff, but in my personal record book, he did not deserve the right to not play the preseason. So I'm just <laughs> going to put that out there. Um, you know, as far as Jerry Tillery, you know, the, the difference between him on the edge versus when he was in the interior last season, to me, was never really from a pass rush standpoint, because you'll see something like that Oakland game, right, where he forced the sack and the fumble on Derek Carr. Uh, that was yeah. from the edge position. It was really the run game because he could not play the defensive end from a run game position. He's not a great run defender in general, but I feel like he's better on the interior doing that than he is uh, probably on the edge. So that's to me what the real difference was in that situation but yeah i mean I, I think seeing justin jones jerry tillery and you know linval joseph for the first time you know this year um against that washington interior is definitely a matchup to watch um sort of more excited about linval and uh, obviously justin jones more 
cautiously optimistic on Jerry Tillery. I think he could open up like he did last year in those first two games against the Bengals and the Chiefs, right. which were very impressive. Um, but, you know, just need to see it because didn't see it in the preseason. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We got all – we each got a key matchup, right? I didn't skip either one of you. Okay. All right. Let's move on now to some X factors. This is going to be a fun conversation. Can't wait to see who you guys pick. Um, I'm going to start us off with, of course – Kenneth Murray. I think Kenneth Murray mm-hmm. is in for a big season, right? Like we've seen a little bit here and there in the preseason and training camp. Of course, he had the, the shoulder injury in OTAs, but he seems like he's finally healthy. And we all talked about it last year. Like we need to see Kenneth Murray blitz. Like we need to see Kenneth Murray blitz. We haven't seen it yet, but we've seen Drew Tranquil blitz. We've seen Kaiser White blitz. And I am ready, man. I'm ready to see the Kenneth Murray coming out party for this season. I think he's going to have a huge season, like I said. And this is a, a huge game for him, too, because, like I said, the interior offensive line of the Washington football team is okay. They're not great. And then you've got to deal with Antonio Gibson and J.D. McKissick, both backs who are very adept at pass, at catching the football, both backs who are kind of more of your elusive space kind of backs. So this is a game for the linebackers, but specifically Kenneth Murray. I think we see him cause a fumble. I think we see him get some pressures. And I'm really expecting a big game from Kenneth Murray. Yeah, I mean, I would expect a big game from Kenneth Murray. I think he'll have to be sort of an X factor. Um, My X factor is going to be an obvious one, um, but I'm going to go with Keenan Allen. Uh, So that might be an obvious one. But uh, I actually saw this from Benjamin Solak. If you actually look at uh, Justin, uh, Justin Herbert and Keenan Allen's last six or so games, prior to Keenan Allen getting hurt, there were about five games in there where he had over 10 receptions and one where he had seven. So like he really started to kind of find his groove prior to the Oakland, uh, you know, hamstring situation that caused him to miss those last three games. So, and there's nobody on Washington from a secondary standpoint that really scares you. Like you have Kendall Fuller, who I think can cause him some problems. You have William Jackson, who uh, I think will be important in this game, but there's no one that really scares you to the prospect of Keenan Allen shutting down. So I think this is one of those games where you can look at Keenan Allen's stat line at the end. And if he has like 60 yards, it probably was a loss. And if he has probably over a hundred over 10 receptions, that kind of game, um, then I think it probably was a win. All right. So I'm going to go from your pick of the most productive receiver in camp to someone who was very unproductive as a receiver in camp. My X factor is Trey McKitty because McKitty will be a big part of that blocking unit up front. Now, could they not use him a a whole lot? Maybe go with more Donald Parham, I suppose. But I'm going to go with McKitty because that's a little more X factor. And he's not expected to play a ton, but I do think he's important because the tight end is a really huge part of that outside zone, that strong rushing attack, because the running back literally runs towards where the tight end was and then has to make a decision largely based on how that tight end handles his responsibilities. A couple of times I saw McKinney make some really good blocks in the training camp and, and at the scrimmage. A couple of times I've seen him whiff. So can he be consistent there? Then as a receiver, I swear I'm going to be right about this one day, even though it's just a gut feeling. He's super athletic. And I saw them try to dial up deep shots yeah. of him at the scrimmage. So are they going to try and get him involved? So I'm really interested to see how he holds up as a blocker because it's been maybe 60% good, 40%. Eh. And then, of course, can he be anything more as a receiver? Because I think the athleticism is there. It might take him longer to develop, and that's fine. But I think if you're trying to exploit this defense, perhaps try to surprise them with someone like Trey McKitty. Because if I'm not mistaken, Gerald Everett for the Rams led the team in receptions or in receiving yards against the Washington football team last year. So using the tight ends, exploiting the tight ends, I think is a really good idea. How involved will he be? I don't know, but that's why he is the X factor, not my key matchup. There we go. I think that's a, a spot on call because. You know, I really think the tight ends are kind of the key to this game offensively, whether it be blocking, whether it be beating the the um, Washington defense at the seam. And also we've seen the tight ends be involved in, in that in those mesh concepts as well as those bootleg concept concepts, you know, like where Justin Herbert rolls out to the right and you have Steven Anderson leak out, you have Donald Parham leak out, Trey McKitty. They all got action in those kind of plays. So they'll all have opportunities to make some plays in this game. So, uh, let's move on to our bold predictions. I accidentally typed bolt predictions here. So sorry about that one. We should keep um, that. I like that. There we go. Bolt predictions. Um, Alex, start us off, man. What's your bold prediction for this game? 
Um, do we are we going to do like a positive one or a negative one or just a positive one, <laughs> or can I attack this from any angle? <laughs> you can do what? both if you want. Okay. But... Um, I will say bold prediction first from a negative, and then we'll end with the positive. I do think Chase Young is going to get two sacks in this game. Um, I don't know if that's like a super bold prediction, but if I have like a over under, you know, plus one and a half line, I just think that he's going to get some of that action, maybe catch uh, Slater off, uh, you know, a little earlier in the game. And then obviously he can be matched up with Balaga sometimes. And then obviously we have the situation where if Balaga goes down, then you're, you know, putting <laughs> Chase Young against Storm Norton on some staffs, which is just right. horrifying to imagine. So, um, I think he'll have a pretty good game this week. And I'm going to say bold prediction, Josh Palmer, six receptions, 45 yards. <laughs> Gosh, I hate How that bold. so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have gone 50, but I was like, is he going to get 50? I don't know. But I'll say, I mean, because he is like the third or fourth wide receiver on this depth chart, because yeah. they have, you know, I think Austin Eckler is going to play this game and all these other options. I think if he got 50 yards in this game, that would be a really good, uh, kind of great opening for him. Yeah, for sure. That, hey, man, six receptions in this game. Hopefully that means no one got injured in this game. And that's why he's yeah. just involved because he's a really good wide receiver three. Uh, I'm going to go with a different receiving option for my bold prediction. Again, this isn't necessarily bold, but I wanted to find some truth in it. Um, I do think that Jared Cook leads the team in receiving yards. But I went back and read Daniel Popper's articles. I believe Jared Cook had the second most receptions of training camp behind Keenan Allen. Very far behind Keenan Allen, but it was, I believe, the second most. So, like yeah. I said, Gerald Everett did lead the Rams in receiving yards against the Washington football team last year. Granted, that was only one game. It's the only game I've looked at. Maybe they were great against tight ends everywhere else. But I do think Jared Cook and uh, Justin Herbert have a very good relationship so far. Cook looks great. They want to get Cook involved. They know how to get Cook involved. I think when you have someone like Joe Lombardi who is – Still, I guess I'm assuming trying to figure out his way as an offensive coordinator, and particularly with this quarterback, with this offense, with this coach. I think going to the well and going back to someone like Jared Cook, who he knows how to work with, I think will work really well for him. So I do think that Jared Cook leads the team in receiving yards. There we go. I, I was going to go with Donald Parham in that same kind of vein. Okay, so, yeah. Um, I'm going to go obviously different. I'll go defensively. Um, I'll say Kyler Fackrell gets more than one sack. Whether that's mm -hmm. one and a half or two, I don't know. But I'm going to say Kyler okay. Fackrell makes an impact in this game. You know, obviously the most productive pass rusher um, in the preseason for the Chargers. And again, mm -hmm. you know, the Washington offensive line is solid. Like I think Charles Leno, their left tackle, is is like a good, you know, left tackle. He's nothing special. So um, I think we'll see the Chargers kind of mix some things up, do some stunts, do some games. And I think Kyler Fackrell has a big day this week. All right, so I'm going to push you to go really bold then. Will Kyler Fackrell or Chase Young have more be more productive? So you got Fackrell versus Cosme and the other guy who stinks versus <laughs> Chase Young, who's going up against Slater. I just called him a solid left like. tackle, and you said he stinks. <laughs> well, he came really like trying to pitch last him. season. <laughs> <laughs> he had 42 pressures last season. He's not that great. Okay. I don't care. He doesn't stink. He's been very consistently healthy. For his there teams, I'll say that. That's true. Okay, That's so true. who's more productive, Chase Young, but it goes against it's Slater, or Fackrell versus whoever they line him up against? I'm gonna go with Kyler Fackrell. All right, I like it. I know I fully respect Alex's opinion on Chase Young having a big day. I think Rashawn Slater is going to have a fantastic rookie debut. I think Rashawn Slater is going to handle his business. So I'm gonna go with Kyler Fackrell. More sacks and pressures. Than Chase Young. I like it. Okay. I like it. All too. right. There we go. All right, guys. Let's uh wrap this conversation up. We're gonna do some league-wide picks. Of course, the Tampa Bay and Dallas game, I think, has kicked off already. Yeah. Um, and then we'll wrap it up the show with our score predictions. So uh we're each going to pick two outright winners. That's dealer's choice, any kind of team you want, and then we're going to pick an underdog that we like to win this game uh, this weekend. So, uh, Tyler, why don't you start us off with your three picks this week? Okay, cool. I get to get the easy ones then. For <laughs> outright winning, I'm going to go uh, Bills over Steelers. I guess that could be kind of close, but I think the Bills are going to take it to them. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to go with the Niners over the Lions. I feel comfortable about that one. 
not because I want Anthony Lynn to not succeed. What I do hope happens in that game, though, apparently Panay Sewell is going to play left tackle that game. So I need Sewell to do really well because I want to see him do well because Decker is supposedly going to be out. So I want to see Sewell do well, but I hope they still lose. And then for <laughs> my underdog, I was never, I was actually going to pick this as an outright thing, um, as a loss for this team. But the underdog now, I'm going to give it to them. I'm going to say the Raiders beat the Ravens on Monday Night Football. It's really ridiculous. Wow. But at this rate, I don't think the Ravens will have any running backs by the time Monday comes around. <laughs> um, but I do I do kind of believe that the Raiders can pull it off again. I respect the offense and Gruden as an offensive play caller. I do think that they have enough talent to make it work. And with Marcus Peters going down for the Ravens, that's very tough for them as well. Yeah. I don't know how cohesive their rushing attack is going to be. I don't know how Lamar is going to look as a... I guess, new passer, if you will, with his new weapons. So I'm going to give it to the Raiders. I do think that there's something there in the same vein that, you know, they really shouldn't have beat the Saints on Monday Night Football last year, but Thomas was out. They snuck in, and the, the Raiders ended up winning that game against the Saints. So I do think my underdog pick is going to be the Raiders beating the Ravens. You're welcome, Dad. That's the only time all season <laughs> I'll do that. That's Look at Tyler showing really... love to his second team. I mean, that's really just heartwarming. It's really my first team. <laughs> now we're going to get an <laughs> Eagles pick from Alex. <laughs> um, really quickly before Alex jumps in, I'm taking the Ravens out of my playoff predictions, man. Like, they're they're a mess. Uh, all three running backs are down. Rashad Bateman's <laughs> injured. Sammy Watkins is injured. Marcus Peters. Like, I think they'll be solid, but I, I'm taking them out of my playoff predictions. Um, all right, Alex, go ahead. Give us your picks for this week. Yeah, I'm going to start with the Patriots minus three over the Dolphins just to go back to Tyler's pick. So the 49ers are an eight point favorite over the Lions right now. Uh, The Bills are six and a half point favorite over the Steelers. And then, yeah, the Raiders line is currently minus four uh, in favor of the Ravens. But I feel like that could move tomorrow based on today's injuries and all stuff like that. So We'll have to see how that plays out. But I'm going to go with the Mac Jones and the Patriots getting the win against the Dolphins. Just kind of need to see more from Tua. And I feel like just in Gillette, this Patriots team has a bit of a, you know, uh, great defensive game. Uh, I really see them kind of taking this one, not by a lot. I think they will win by a touchdown or so. Um, Just don't trust that Miami offense yet. And they're getting Dante Hightower back, who is a nightmare to deal with. Um, So... That is going to be my first pick. My second pick, I am going to pick the uh, Packers over the Saints, minus three and a half in the inaugural Jacksonville Classic. Uh, that will happen down there. <laughs> uh, so I'm, curi- uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what Winston is like that game, but I will go with the right. Packers. And Steven said it. Yeah, I'm going to go Eagles plus three. Beat the Falcons. <laughs> so me and <laughs> oh Tyler are both showing love to our second teams. <laughs> oh, man, that is too funny. Okay, so for uh, have to mention really quickly again, you know, shout out to our our sponsor Busser. Again, if you're able to use our website and the link and the code, uh, your first five, the first five of you will have a an additional ten dollar bet to make. So uh, free money is always good. So go take advantage. Um, for my first pick, I'm going to take the Seattle Seahawks um, over the Indianapolis Colts. They're favored by three. I'm surprised that's not more. To be honest with you, given mm-hmm. the way that the Colts are, are kind of in in flux right now. Uh, don't really know about Carson Wentz's health. Quentin Nelson's probably not going to play in this game. Uh, so I think the Seattle Seahawks minus three is kind of an enticing bet for this weekend. Um, I'm going for the underdog pick next. I think the Cleveland Browns are going to go into Arrowhead and get a win. I am a big believer in the Browns this season. Um, the Chiefs are favored by minus five and a half. Um, so that really feels like an underdog pick to me. You know, I think there's a lot of like plus threes. So, uh, giving the Browns plus five and a half to me, I think is very enticing. I would take the points at a minimum. Um, but I do think the Cleveland Browns are going to be my upset pick. Um, and then my other pick outright, I think the New York Giants are going to beat the Denver Broncos. I think, you know, it's the first it's the 20 year anniversary of nine 11. And of course the New York giants are, are going to be playing with a lot of emotion. I also just don't think the Denver Broncos are all that good. Um, in, in terms of offense, I think you know, there's a lot of unproven players there and I'm just not sold on Teddy Bridgewater. So I'm going to buy the New York giants getting an emotional victory in week one and then kind of sucking the rest of the year. I like it. I was actually going to pick the giants over the Broncos because I believe the giants are not favored to win that one. So 
I was going to go with the Giants, but I had to go with the Raiders. Yeah, the Broncos are uh, favored by three, which I don't really understand. That really feels like a toss-up. Like, I, I really feel like that could go either way, but uh, just going to go with the emotions of that game. Mm -hmm. I like it. All right, guys, it is time to wrap up today's show with our score predictions for the Chargers and Washington football team. Uh, so excited about this matchup. Of course, if you watched Alex on, on the YouTube show, uh, you probably already heard his score prediction. So, Alex, I'll let you go first, um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, I kind of go back and forth on this one. Uh, I, I My final score will be Washington 23, Chargers 20. So I am predicting a week one L. I, there's just too many things that I don't like about this game. Uh, I could see either team winning, but traveling to the East Coast with, you know, an offensive line that's still looking for cohesion, going against the best defensive line. Um, <laughs> I feel like if this was a game that was later in the season, right, and you're dealing with Washington in week eight or week nine, I feel like I would feel a lot more confident about it just because this offensive line and this team would have had a better chance to play together and that defense wouldn't quite intimidate me as much. Um, you know, I'd rather, I guess, play the Cowboys or even maybe a little bit play the Chiefs this week than Washington with how great they are in the trenches. Um, so I kind of would have liked this game to have been later in the season. Uh, you obviously have Ron Rivera coaching against the first time head coach. That's no disrespect to Staley, but like, you know, Washington's really running it back with a coaching staff from last year. That's very experienced. Uh, so yeah. I am a little bit worried about that as well. And this is also kind of a game. Like I said, if Alex Smith was the quarterback of Washington, I probably would pick the Chargers still. Hey man, but what's because with all the Alex Rick Smith hate today. I'm not hating Alex Smith. I'm just saying he throws like three yards per attempt and it's a lot of think and dunk, but Ryan Fitzpatrick can stretch the field. So uh, also, you know, the thing about Alex Smith is he's still missing that calf muscle. So I don't know if he can, <laughs> he can successfully <laughs> plant his leg too much anymore. Um, but yeah, so overall I could see it going either way and wouldn't fault anyone for picking the chargers in this game. I, you know, the, the spread in this game is actually that the chargers are a, uh, a one even. Oh no, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's been even kind of going back and forth. The chargers were initially favorite. Washington is a one point favorite, but they're also at home. So, I mean, that kind of means on a neutral field, the chargers would be favored by two points. Uh, so that's sort of a toss up game either way. Uh, could certainly see it going either way. Don't really have strong opinions on it, but I do think Washington's defense kind of buckles down and gets them the win here. I think in a previous regime, I would definitely agree. And again, I could totally, I could see it absolutely going that way with the Chargers lose. I just think, you know, considering they needed help with coaching and special teams and defensive schemes and situational awareness, I think all four of those things, even if they're not amazing right now, some are, but even if they're not great, I think they're better. And so I do think the Chargers have just done enough and are mentally there. When you talk about Brandon Staley, right? And he talks about how his defense, you can close your eyes and know what the defense is doing because you can hear them. You can hear that the communication is there. Because, and he knows now that his defense is ready because they're starting to recognize things. He can close his eyes and tell. So I do think that they will all mentally be there and ready. They are very healthy. This is the first time we're seeing Jerwin James and Joey Bosa together uh, on week one. And I do think that means something to this defense. I think the team wants to prove that they are better. If they win this game, I really think that's almost a tone setter for the rest of the year. Because if this offense can go and just put up enough points and beat the Washington football team, who can't they really score against? Maybe Cleveland, maybe Denver. Like you're you're so raw as an offense. And if you go out and win this game, I think it just sets the tone. I really think this team will fight like hell for Staley. I think they're very well prepared for this game. You know, Fitzpatrick, yes, he can be Fitz Magic, but I do think you can take advantage of him. Like you talk about the it's interceptable ball uh, percentage there. So I'm going to make it really close. I'm going to see the Chargers win uh, 23 to 20 in this game. All right. So both of you guys expecting some low scoring uh, output this weekend. I agree with Tyler. I think the Chargers are going to win. Um, I, I think, you know, in a normal year, I probably would feel differently. Like, or I say normal in terms of like injuries, but we went through a whole show and we barely talked about Derwin James. Like we barely <laughs> talked about an elite player yeah. in the NFL making his return to the field. Um, I'm glad you brought up the Joey Bosa and him not playing very often. 
to me, that's a huge deal. Like if that was mm-hmm. one of if that was an X factor pick for one of us, I would have been like, okay, like that's true. Like that is absolutely right. And I just think the Chargers are set up well enough in the areas that the Washington, I think, is going to struggle this season. I think they have the personnel to get some interceptions from Ryan Fitzpatrick. Alex mentioned Michael Davis. Uh, Tyler mentioned Asante Samuel Jr. I just mentioned Derwin James. So I think they have the horses to kind of take advantage of the areas that Washington is going to struggle with. That was a great point by Tyler bringing up uh, the kickoff team or kickoff return team for the Chargers. If Nasir Adderley is able to get a big return, I think that's a huge deal. So I think this is going to be a little higher scoring than some people are expecting. We've seen in years past that September is kind of the month of the offenses, and then the defenses are kind of able to really pick up on some things and adjust and, and make some, some later plays in the season. So I'm not expecting like a shootout by any means, but I'm going to pick the Chargers 27 over the Washington football team, 23. So uh, I think that, again, I think the Chargers are just set up in, in some really great spots to take advantage of what the Washington football team kind of struggles with. So I'm going to go Chargers 27, Washington 23. I'd love if, to be wrong. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, just generally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to be, I'd love to be wrong on the pick uh, and have the team win. But I feel like this just kind of lines up with my philosophy looking at these early games in the schedule. Maybe not so much the Ravens anymore, but still, you got to play the Browns, you got to play the football team, you got to play the Chiefs. um, And those are teams that are going to be real problems for the Chargers. So, my viewpoint really throughout this whole process, when I first saw the schedule, was I thought the Chargers were going to be a better second half than a first half team. So, I'll be predicting them to beat the Bengals and the Giants when the time comes. So, you know, it'll (laughs) even out. And the Eagles, (laughs) don't lie. We'll see about that one. I don't, who knows what they're it's week, <laughs> nine weeks away. I know. I, I I will say, like Alex is right. Like sometimes, you know, of course we would love to say Chargers win every single week, but uh, sometimes we've got to pick with our brains. And if your brain is is telling you that, you know, the Washington football team has the advantage, then I I, I absolutely think then you go with that. Unfortunately for for some people, I know everybody kind of has their style in terms of predicting and picking, um, but there will be games that we all pick the Chargers to lose this year. That's just kind of they're going to lose some games. It's just the fact of the mm-hmm. matter. So, um, Tyler, any final thoughts before we wrap up today's show? Yes, Stephen. The first two touchdowns scored in the NFL this season were by two of your receivers in fantasy football. Yes, let's go. I saw that Tom Brady threw a, a touchdown to uh, Chris Godwin already. Who was the second one? CeeDee Lamb? CeeDee Lamb. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Let's go. Fantasy points. Um, Alex, <laughs> any final thoughts before we wrap up today's show, man? Uh, my final thought is no one cares about your fantasy team. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I do. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm excited for the first game of the season. It feels so great to just have football back um, in the air again. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I missed it a lot. You know, once the Super Bowl ended and you went through all these months of sort of like, are are we in the pandemic? Are we out of the pandemic? And we're so, we still don't really have a resolution on that. Um, but just having something to look forward to. It is just, you know, really fun. And, you know, I finally get to stop, you know, pretending I love baseball for like, you know, at least a couple of weeks and then October comes around. So I, I can do that at least. At least you can kind of pretend, man. I, I straight up hate baseball. Like I talked myself into watching <laughs> golf this summer and it was just like, you know, that was better. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I don't like baseball very much. There's some emotional watching, things. Watching it on TV is awful. Yeah. And, and plus, you what you turn on golf and you you take a nap. Like I don't know what it is. It's just it's a nap inducing sport, which kind of makes it fun. Um, but yeah, <laughs> now this has been a great show, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, as always, like I said, make sure and like the video, comment, subscribe. We always appreciate the feedback. Uh, we are going to be doing a live Q and A on Saturday. That's going to be a weekly thing that we do throughout the season. Um, those who support us on Patreon have first dibs on asking questions. Um, and if you do ask, ask us a question on Patreon, it will be, uh, answered. I can guarantee that if you ask us a question on YouTube, we'll probably get to it. But, uh, if you want to make sure that your, your question is 100% guaranteed to be answered by us, uh, sign up for Patreon and of course, ask that question. So that's going to do it for us today, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Hopefully by the time that we are recording on Sunday, the Chargers will be coming out with a win. Really just cannot wait to uh, watch this weekend. And this has been the Guilty as Charged podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.